Oh, I got it upside down. What an idiot. All right, continuing this uh, how to make an abstract piece little series or whatever you want to call it with the instructional um, and art process playlist. Uh, we're going we're gonna to pick up where we left off. So last time we just had an overview of, of what it really takes to make an abstract piece. We talked about planning, texture, and then the painting process a little bit, again, as an overview in general terms. And then I also talked about um, uh, color, texture, and composition. So you really need those are those elements that make up an abstract piece, is, is your use of color, your use of texture, and then the composition of it, uh, because we don't have anything objective or figurative in the piece at all. Uh, but as for the, the stages of actually making it, I guess there's that planning and then putting down texture, which some people, I mean, you, you might need to skip that step at first and you do it later during the painting process, but we're going to do it my way. <laughs> and then the actual painting process would come last. We said maybe titling would be a fourth thing that you might do. But today we're going to talk about the planning and what that means. We're going to go through some, some pieces that I have here um, that are completed, one that's almost complete that I just did yesterday, and we're going to talk about um, the next piece that I'm going to make um, and, and kind of the, the ideas and stuff floating around there. So I guess the planning, again, doesn't necessarily have to take a lot of time. It doesn't have to be intimidating. Um, everyone does it differently. So some people think about a concept, whether it's for an abstract or not, but again, we're talking about abstracts. They think about a concept that they want to express. They think about different colors, using them as symbols, different shapes, organic shapes, or, or geometric shapes, um, or whatever. They think about all these things and what they could mean and how to possibly put them in a piece. They think about the composition in the planning. They map it out. They do sketches in their books. They, they try different colors and, and make color palettes and try them out, how these blend, how these work together, um, how these con like the contrast between these colors. All this, like, there's all this planning you could possibly do. You could spend hours and hours planning. I do not do that. So generally my planning is, is just like the way that I live my life, which sounds really, I don't know, hokey or like... I don't, I don't know, <laughs> but like I read stuff, I take in media, I write things down when I have an idea, I'm like, whoa, that would be a good painting. Usually it's with words, it's usually my own words or like quotes from shows or, or like I said, movies or poetry or book I'm reading or a podcast I'm listening to. Just I just get ideas from, from different sources of media a lot. Sometimes it's something a friend has said and I'm like, wow, that wording was really beautiful and I like that and I think that would influence this piece. So generally, my planning happens very informally. Uh, it's just like I have I have a thought, uh, either of my own because of it's influenced by something, right? My thought uh, isn't completely just original randomly. It's influenced by my own interactions with myself or my interactions with someone else or other forms of media. So um, then I write that down. So I mean, I've got different text conversations with people where I, I would put something in parentheses. And I would text it to them, and I lock that message. That's just a signal to me that, like, oh, this is something I want to talk about later. Or sometimes it's a reminder for me uh, if I don't have anything else around. I've got, um, I I've got like books that I have hundreds of ideas in that are titles. I try to categorize them sometimes. Like these are from movies. These are like people and portraits I want to do, or whatever. I've got the whiteboard here in the room too. That sometimes when I'm in the middle of painting. Uh, I'm like, oh, I need to write that down. Sometimes I'll write it on the wall or, or whatever. I have a list on my phone as well. I've got these different areas all around where I'm like, oh, that would be a sick title or that would be a really great idea to explore. And I write it down. And I'm probably never, ever going to actually complete them all in my life. Uh, like I said, I've got hundreds and hundreds of things written down. And some of them I don't even remember. If I go back to it and some stuff I wrote years ago, I'm like, I don't even remember what I was going to do with that. Like, wh what was the idea that I had? I don't even remember. So that's, that's the trouble with not working as fast as the ideas you get, I guess. Or, or maybe that's a good filter for, like, that idea wasn't worth exploring anyway. But anyway, so the planning for me originally, it, it, like I said, is very informal. I mean, all of it's kind of informal in my opinion. But it just comes with, like, an idea of, like, oh, I would like to paint that. That's usually how it goes. For me, it's, like, either one or two ways when it comes to painting an abstract. It's usually, again, inspired by something. And the planning portion is, like, a little, it's just... There's a lot, it's mostly mental and there's not a lot of writing things down or diagrams and like 
doing traditional research and like, oh, I would like to incorporate some like eucalyptus plant in my in my piece. What does eucalyptus mean? Where did it come from? What is the the origin of the word and the plant and all that? Because some people do that. That's how they make their art, and it's and it, and it makes those symbols very very strong. I just don't do that. I don't do a lot of this extra research and make it like like 20 layers deep of like, well, this one element in here is goes back to these ancient times or whatever, and I just don't do that. Anyway, uh, so either I kind of have this idea, I write it down, and then um, I, well, well, we'll talk about that in a bit, but I, I write it down to that first part of the planning. I mean, like, I just think about it, I mean, it just hits me, and I'm like, hey, this is a great, this would, this inspires me. This is art to me. I just need to make it visual now. Because um, we're talking about visual art right now, and, and some of this stuff comes from my own writing, where I'm working out an idea, and I'm, I'm, I'm just free-form writing, whether it's poetry or prose or what have you, and sometimes even from my own writing, I get an idea of I want to visualize that idea or that concept that I wrote about, um, and do that with an abstract painting. Recently, very recently, I would say in the past two years, I've just had the, the hunger to sometimes just do more design work, or I'm just like, I just want to paint. Right now, I just want to paint. I want to, and I've been making art about art sometimes, but sometimes like I just really want to paint something abstract. Like that's something that I'm pretty confident in my abilities in. It's really a lot of fun. I, I'm fairly sure, like even though sometimes problems arise when you're making a piece, that I'll resolve the problem, and it feels good to resolve problems, right? So uh, sometimes I just want to make something, and I don't have an idea yet. So I just think like I look around sometimes, and I'm like, oh, I got this canvas over here. Why don't we use that? And then I'm just like, you know, what kind of mood am I in? And I go, I turn to music. Music is such a huge part of my artistic process. And then I'm like, hey, well, what mood am I in? I guess I'm in this kind of mood. Let's put on some music. And then I start working with colors and, and thinking of, of that, um, which we're going to kind of talk about here. But those are the kind of the two ways. And, and most of it, for the bulk of my art making um, practice, has been the former. It's like I get this inspiration. I get this idea. I really want to express that visually. How do I do that? And more recently, sometimes, and I have an example here that we'll go through, is where I was like, I just feel like painting. I just want to paint. Let's do it. And then, sometimes it's purely design, and sometimes it definitely blurs that line, and sometimes I end up finding meaning while I make the painting. In the process, I find meaning. Um, and, and, and give the piece meaning, and, and give it a concept while I'm painting. So that's kind of that overview of what, what I mean by planning, I guess. Um, we're going to start with something pretty heavy that, that I've actually used with students to a degree before and, and talked about. Um, I've never made another piece really like this, but this is, a, this is an example of the most planning I've ever done to make an abstract piece. I'm going to grab that right now. So, this piece is made in 2012. It's going to be really hard to see a lot of the things going on in it. It's very dark, um, and uh, yeah, there's... You know, just through the camera and the lighting and stuff in here, you're not going to be able to see all the subtle color variances and things like that. But it is called A Dance with Scarlet, A Self-Loathing Sonnet. So, this is, I want to say, one of the first abstract pieces I've ever made. Um, and like I said, I just, I, you know, haven't made a piece really this much, um, this formal or this much planning or, or this much you know, again, conceptual pre-thinking and staging things and like, what am I going to do where? I've never, I haven't done that uh, with any other piece to this degree. So, but this is, you know, why I want to talk about it. Because this is something I did make and how some people do their stuff and, and whatever. So, uh, Dance with Scarlet, a self-loathing sonnet. So, again, my titles generally really uh, point to the direction. Like, sometimes they're pretty heavy-handed and direct as to what the piece is about. Sometimes they're a little more cryptic. Uh, they're never really nonsensical, though. They always align with the piece somehow, um, and the mood of it, and what maybe the, the viewer should be getting out of it because of, of what I'm trying to communicate, what I did communicate through creating it. So, again, third time. I guess everything's going to go threes at least. A Dance with Scarlet, a Self-Loathing Sonnet. So, I'm going to walk you through this uh, piece here, and we'll see how much you can see there. So, um... I made this while I was at the U of S and I was using some of the studio space there. So I'm going to move a bit here. I don't, know, I don't even know where to start with this. Okay, so um, I'm trying to think how have I approached this with students before, but I planned that a lot more like a, like a real lesson plan. So um, 
Oh, we can talk about, I mean, if we talk, if we, I guess we'll go through the thing I talked about last time, color, texture, composition. So colors, I was, I was, in that period of time, I was working with this color palette that was all black, white, and like crimson. I made like a, 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 a not a lot, but I made some pieces in that time period that I didn't use any other color uh, than, than this like crimson, red, scarlety type, burgundy, whatever. Like that, that was there. Um, red was, was a part of that. And then just black and white. And that was kind of it. So um, I find a lot of, I mean, with black and white being so opposite on the ends of the spectrum with and high contrast, I really like high contrast things that are bold and, and just kind of hit you and strike you that way where you notice the contrast and you notice the difference. And I felt like red is this this color that to me is, is one of my favorite colors for a long time because it's so diverse in meaning. I mean, a lot of colors mean different things in different cultures, but red is so strong, like... If you think of green, like how many different shades of green could you have? You could have tons of different shades of green, like olive green, lime green, forest green, like neon green, all these different, mint green. Um, when I think of red, a lot of people think of like like fire engine red or just like this basic red. Obviously you've got some room to play there too with different things, but then we get into like whole different colors and like yeah, green could shift into like teals and turquoise and aqua and you call it something else. Well, like red just seems like so strong that a lot of people see a very similar shade of red when you say red. My car is red. You're looking for, you know, um, it's not on this piece, but I mean like, like this, uh, I don't even know if you can see that. It doesn't matter. Anyway, I really like red. It's very bold. Um, and also, again, a lot of diverse meanings because you, you think about things even in, in, in our uh, like more Western culture or whatever, like American Canadian things and, and idioms and sayings and, and things of that nature that are just like, you know, red is associated with love and hearts and Valentine's Day and red roses and all that. It's also very, you know, we connect it with blood and, and that's, well, I sh shouldn't have said that yet. I'm going to get into it in a second, but red also we associate with anger so much like, oh, I was so angry. I was seeing red or you talk about like, you know, the like a bull in a china shop or like a bull with like a, like a, like the matadors and the red, uh, like capes and, and stuff. So it's just, we've got anger, we've got love. I mean, in different cultures, joy, like joy, red is like, like in Asian cultures, I find a lot of time from my knowledge, it's like very, like a joyful, happy, celebrated color. Um, but it, yeah, it's got a lot of diversity. And I mean, again, every color probably has that within certain cultures, there's differences in what they could possibly mean, but I find red is so strong. Um, and it means a lot of different things. And like I mentioned, blood. So I think red also has this thing where, to me, blood has been a very important part of my work too, with with symbolizing that uh, metaphorically with using certain colors and stuff. Because to me, blood means everything. Blood is blood is blood is life. Like b like blood, um, you know, is life and death. It's mortality. If it's in your body, if it's out of your body, why is it out of your body? How is it out of your body? It's so important. I mean, it's what sustains. I mean, there's a lot of things that sustain life, but blood is one of them, and it's can be associated to certain shades of red and certain colors, right? Crimson. Um, so that's really important too for me. I find that it can be very violent. It can be super aggressive. It could be, you know, um, it could also be something that's the beautiful, like a beautiful expression that involves love, blood flow. What gets your, your blood flowing? What do you get excited about? What do you think about intimacy and, and virginity and, and sex and all these different things that associate themselves with, with blood. Um, and again, like, just what what makes it move uh you be donating blood these these sacrificial acts like talk about like the blood of christ like anyway there's tons and tons there's so much there it's so rich that um i loved using that i still do sometimes that i used some of my own blood in, in paintings as well uh from time to time but anyway <laughs> i've spent way more time talking about color than i thought i was going to but that's kind of like the color palette i was working in we're going to get back into color in a bit here when we get to some of the symbols. Talking about texture, this is very purposely textured as well. And texture, some of this was applied before. Um, well, no, actually, it was all applied during uh, the, the piece. It wasn't like before the piece. Like, I'm going to show you some other stuff when we talk about texture more and how to prepare this piece that I'm going to talk about. Um, but tech, there's a lot of different textures going on here. It was on Masonite board. Masonite board is very, very smooth. Very smooth. And I wanted to make this very rough, I wanted to make it aggressive, and I had all these other things going on. So during the making of the piece, texture is very important in this piece because it really adds, not just to a general feeling, like some of the abstracts will be very um, 
it's just a general feeling you get like oh that's very smooth it's very rough what does that mean how it works with the colors this way but this is, is a little more specific so I mean we've got these like like hand marks almost like claw marks to me that's symbolizing a lot of struggle um, we have these cuts right into the board which we'll get into in a bit as well there's some gesso here that I, I kind of use it as a as a medium for affixing these cigarette butts, which are also texture, right? Um, the physical, real texture. So those are the kind of ones I want to focus on. Um, the, the gesso I applied in a very rough fashion, but I used it as an adhesive. Um, and we'll get closer to some of these, these things here that I'm talking about. Um, so there's these cuts that I made precision like into the board, into the masonite board. Um, they're, they're there for a very specific reason. And again, like the, uh, Cigarette butts are there as well. And there's like these, these kind of claw marks, these, these marks of struggle. Um, I find hands are very powerful symbols as well because it's upon, upon a first meeting with somebody or, or whatever, usually. I mean, if you're shaking hands, if you're being aggressive with hands or whatever, like hands are just how you... The first thing you would use to like maybe touch another person, you know, um, in whatever manner. So anyway, hands I find are very, very powerful symbols and how they're expressed in paintings as well. So, um, okay, so let's go back to the title, A Dance with Scarlet, A self loving Song. We talked about color, we talked about texture a bit, um, the composition here. Composition is, is very, very hard to, to teach. Um, I don't go by this whole rule of thirds nonsense or whatever. I, I find that, you know, it's it's... <laughs> It's just like, oh, does it look good? <laughs> then it looks good. Like, where's the push and pull? Uh, where, where, where do you want the viewer's eye to be? Mostly in an abstract piece, you want the viewer's eye to be everywhere, not fixated on one thing. If I put a person's face there, that's going to be what you look at. Generally, that's what happens with text as well. If you put text into a piece, you, you want to read the text, and that's where you focus. Usually that's the case. Um, so you try to avoid that or use it in a way that's that's a, that's purposeful. Everything we should be we're talking about how to do things purposely and with intention. It doesn't always mean this much planning. Again, we're gonna look at some other pieces that are not gonna take as long as this. But uh, I, I think this one's interesting. I like talking about it. So, um, yeah. So composition was very important in this for a lot of reasons. So uh, I guess we're gonna skip into again. I don't want to go back and forth too much, but this isn't very linear sometimes. So. Again, the, the piece, A Dance with Scarlet, A Self-Loathing Sonnet. We deconstruct the title alone, A Dance with Scarlet. We're talking about who's Scarlet. Let's say Scarlet is a woman. We're just inferring without having any background knowledge yet, and we'll kind of ease our way into that. So, A Dance with Scarlet. I mean, dance has always, for so long, been a euphemism or um, a symbol for sex a lot of the time. So you could be talking about, like, oh, sex with a woman. Okay, that's where we're at. We're talking about that. A self-loathing sonnet. So a sonnet is a type of poem. We're talking about self-loathing. We're talking about a sexual experience that has self-loathing. Um, when we look at these colors, we look at the textures, we look at what's going on, and there's different symbols happening in here. Um, so the most obvious thing, again, it, like its placement and how I did it, I didn't want to draw the most attention because I want the viewer's eye to kind of go everywhere. But at the bottom here, um, we, we have a capital A, a scarlet or a red, capital A. Now, if you've read The Scarlet Letter, or you've watched the movie, or you just know about it, because, I mean, you could definitely know about the story of The Scarlet Letter without reading it or watching it. Uh, but it is about a woman who commits an adulterous act with somebody, and then the woman is, is forced to wear The Scarlet Letter on her chest, so that everyone in the community knows, hey, she's an adulterer. The capital A is for adultery. So, this symbol just for being, um, uh, not having a, a, um, a faithful interaction, I guess, with, with someone or, or having a partner that you cheat on or something like that. We, we could talk about the Scarlet Letter in that context, or like I said, cheating, or, or however you want to use the, the terms. Um, but this capital A is here. It's meant to be seen, but I don't want it to be so overpowering that it takes you just, boom, right here, and you don't see anything else. I want the eyes to wander. So a dance with Scarlet, we were referencing that maybe there was an act here that was was not faithful, um, thus the self-loathing comes in maybe from that act, and that's very surface level, um, and, and but that's kind of what this piece is about. The piece is about this this interaction that I had, um, or maybe that someone else had, or both, uh, that, that, that there was unfaithfulness happening in, in these romantic relationships. So there's a lot more going on, but I said it was deliberate. So one thing is I called it a sonnet. 
Um, I like, I've always liked poetry, writing it, reading it, um, referencing it, etc. So um, at the, I, the time that I was doing this, I had this idea that I wanted to like talk about Italian sonnets or patriarchal sonnets, they're called both. There's a certain structure to some poetry that's very, very specific with how many lines in a stanza, how many stanzas, and then also the concept or the story being told through the poem needs to change at some point. Or uh, there's like a story arc at a certain point in the poem, and that's what this is. These cuts symbolize the structure of an Italian sonnet, where the lines are, how the stanzas are broken up, and the fact that there is some here and some here. Um, there's a point in an Italian sonnet called the turn, and that is happening from like here, the lines end, and then we've got lines here. So that is what's being represented. So again, I'll kind of get close up so you can kind of see these these lines. One, two, three, four. They're, they're cuts into the board, which I mean, could symbolize a lot of things to you. I have a history of self-harm, which I'm sure I'll talk about in the video. Um, we talked about self-loathing with this piece already in the title. But these cuts here represent literal lines of a poem, of an Italian sonnet. And, and talking about what those sonnets may, may have in them conceptually, generally, as well. Uh, so those are there. And that, again, this, we're talking about composition right now. It's the whole point of, of this, and we're kind of breaking it down into symbols as to why we put certain things where. Um, I guess we could even talk about just use of paint. Um, like, with, with some of them are coming out, like these black drips are coming out of these lines. I mean, the drips could be referencing blood, they could be referencing tears, both things that would fit into this piece, right? Um, also, I mean, we've got directions going on. We've got these directions going down, down. We've got these ones going this way. Um, aggressively, but trying to be straight, like like a line in a poem. Um, yeah, so we, we've got different directional qualities that are happening too, because movement is something that you want in a piece. If you don't want someone's eye fixated in one spot, you need to create something that, that um, makes, makes gestures, I guess, and movement, and, and for someone to want to bounce their eye around. Uh, and you can do that. So the last thing I guess we'll talk about with, with the composition and, I mean, again, texture, all these things blend together, are these uh, cigarette butts. So what could I possibly be referencing with these cigarette butts? Um, when I, you know, taught using this piece before, uh, I, I asked students, like, what is that? What, is, what do you think of when you think of cigarette butts? And, or, I mean, just cigarettes, period. And we're like, oh, smoking, cancer, bad things, unhealthy. And then we, we start to get somewhere. So, okay, so there's no positive association that you can make with smoking cigarettes. Okay, good. So it's just a negative thing. We start there. Um, and then some people talk about, like, oh, you know, like, habits, like, form around, like, this is whatever. Um, for me, cigarettes are so many. It's a loaded, another object that's loaded. But to me, there's this association with death, right? And, like, smoking, cancer, death, unhealthy, whatever suicide about like i mean you know it's like killing yourself even faster or what what, ha what have you and some people you know smoke for decades and nothing happens and some people smoke a little bit and then they end up with lung cancer right um but but there's this negative impact it's a coping mechanism for a lot of people too they're like they could associate oh no smoking calms me well that's a pavlovian thing you've you've used smoking in such a way that it is the thing you go to that it, it, you've conditioned yourself to get calmer and less stressed when you are stressed because you're using a smoke to do that. You could also be having tea instead. Anyway, it's got very negative health benefits physiologically, biologically, whatever. Um, so there's that going on. And anything that plays with death, again, also plays with sex because a little death, that term referencing orgasm with sex. So we've got sex already brought up here. We've got negative coping mechanisms. So um, th those, you know, negative coping mechanisms. And smoking also is a very sexy thing. I mean, depending on who you are. If you, if you take the, uh, the facts away of like, what is that person doing to their body? Or maybe you don't like the smell, uh, but it, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that, you know, someone's using their hands in an intimate way, putting it to their lips. Um, you know, it, and it can be a very s sexy thing, right? So there's this allure of, of smoking, um, or maybe even to strip it down, like, yeah, I, I, when I was a teenager, I thought smoking was so cool, whatever. Um, and then it's really not cool, and it's not a healthy thing, etc. but it could draw you in, and it's poisonous, and what have you. So that kind of adds into all of this, too. Negative, using sex as a negative coping mechanism. Um, and then feeling shameful about that, regretful about that, and self-loathing because of how you've engaged in those activities, um, you know, if you're being unfaithful to someone that you actually care about, um, that would negatively impact you. So 
that's <laughs> that's kind of going through this whole piece, like I said. But all this has been planned. This is the whole point I'm talking about. This like the planning. I didn't draw any diagrams or whatever, really. But I just kind of like mentally looked at this and said, where am I going to put stuff? So this abstract is very different than the abstracts I make today. Like I said, this was 2012. I've made a lot of abstracts since then. Um, and it's not that I would be opposed to doing this. It's just not where my mind goes anymore now that I've done it so many times. But this is very strong um, conceptually, emotionally. The symbols, the placement is very thought out. And I just don't work that way generally anymore. Again, the other ones will be much quicker, but this is an example of what some people would do, and they would do even more research, etc., into things like this. But I think that's all that we need to talk about with this. Um, so I just want to, uh, again, I just want to give you examples of like stuff that I've done that's like, this is how I make an abstract. That's one way, for some people that's like, eh, boring, and some people are like, oh, crazy, I didn't think there's that much planning and stuff involved, and, and you know, for me, usually there isn't, but. Um, so I picked this one next. This is one that I just made last year, and it is, uh, there's this Latin term that I forget, in Quilinus, whatever, I, I forget the, the, the name of it. Um, but uh, in filth that will be found is the, is the, uh, there's tape on here, oops. In filth that will be found is the, the translation. Um, I'm sure that this concept has been around before Carl Jung. But uh, he kind of popularized this this notion with, like you know, psychology or philosophy or whatever you want to call it. I'm going to use this arm this time. Um, this is again. There's a little bit of planning going on here, but it's much more surface level and basic. Um, not amazing, uh, you know. But but anyway. So in filth, it will be found is this concept of like you have to do the dirty work. You have to dig within yourself that filth, that that stuff you don't want to talk about, that you don't want to even admit to yourself, in order to change. Um, it says, in filth, it will be found. What is it? It is the thing that you are searching for to better yourself. It is this, this, this thing that you, that, you want to, um, that you want to engage and grow, I guess, into a positive thing. So um, you will only find that by doing the hard work, which is what he references as the filth. So I just wanted to, I just loved this, just the wording, again, in filth, it will be found. Um, and I just wanted to play with that. So... I had this this canvas, and then um, what I did was again, if we're going to talk about it on stages, like what is the planning process? I I heard a podcast, uh, and I was listening to this podcast. They were talking about this, and then um, somebody mentioned like, oh, and filth it will be found, and they started deconstructing. I was like, man, I love that phrasing. I wrote it down. Didn't know what I was going to do with it, and then pretty quickly I was like, you know what? I want to paint this piece. I'm going to do this whole thing, um, and and again, it's not like amazingly complex, but. <sighs> Black, symbolizing filth. We've got, I'm getting aggressive gestures with the, the texture. Um, you know, there's rips and there's scratches and there's like burn marks in here. Um, you, there, there is some physical texture that I applied to this ahead of time as well. It wasn't all during the process. There's gesso on here that's very thick. And, uh, you know, if I bring this closer, maybe you can see some of the gesso and how it's applied in this very thick manner. You know, it's, it's dirty. It's not pretty in a traditional sense or aesthetic quality that a lot of people recognize as pretty. This is supposed to symbolize dirtiness and filth and, and what have you. And that's why it's black. I mean, it could have used colors that were dirtier um, or whatever, like these dirty browns. It could have mixed a bunch of things, but I wanted this black because it's usually associated very negatively and and, and that's what I wanted to, 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 to go through, is that you have to get through this dark place, this dark part of yourself to find it in the the positive stuff the, the stuff that you want to work through um, that that would be your best self or I don't know you could you would put it in a lot of ways so in these holes you can see behind them somewhat um, what I did was I, I applied gold leaf metal leaf there's copper there's silver there's gold um, you can kind of see it there and and that's you know like I feel like deconstructing it's really basic being like oh behind there there's gold um but it was this this beautiful metallic this this stuff that people value in some ways obviously in a physical form or monetary but that's not what we want to get it we want to get at this like you know stay gold like you know this this positive thing within you um so i mean the composition is much more erratic the planning was just like mental planning of like, oh man, I had this great idea. How do I do that? What do I want to do with that? How do I put the, the stuff behind? So, I mean, for me, I took this other strip of canvas from another piece that I was not using anymore. 
Um, that's why this is all painted over because it was all part of another canvas. So I just took it, as you can see, I cut it out of the other thing, and then I um, I used uh, a spray adhesive, and I just like sprayed it to the back of the frame so that this other piece of canvas was behind this, behind the frame. So when I made these cuts, there's the space in between, and you can kind of see back there. So I applied the, the metal leaf to this other canvas and then affixed it that way. So again, there's still some stuff going on here, a little bit of planning, a little bit more like conceptual or whatever. Um, I don't remember what I was listening to when I made this, but I mean, every time I make a piece too, I'm listening to music that's going to help me stay in that place, whatever that is. Um, and this wasn't a negative piece. It looks really not cool, but again, like you have to go through pain and, and, and other things to really get to a positive place in your life. You need hardship, you need, there's no story without conflict. You need to sometimes initiate your own conflict within yourself. So anyway, that's what that's all about. So, this one's gonna be even quicker to explain. Um, see if you can really see all of it here. Uh, this is very musical, very m more design-based. Um, it is called Mindless Self-Indulgence, which is the name of a great band. Um, and I don't, I don't know where to point you directly to, to one album or whatever, but they've got a lot of music out there. Uh, and um, yeah, they're, they're a lot of fun. So I was just like one of those moods of man, I just want to paint. That's what I want to do right now. What do I, what do I want to do? What do I want to paint? I was here, I made this piece in about a half an hour. Um, I didn't put any texture on it first, really. Uh, the texture that is on here is, is physical texture, somewhat with applying thicker paint, and then also some implied texture, which is how I made the, my, my brush strokes and stuff. But um, I guess I should, I can't really be beside it. Let's do this, let's just rock out like this. No, let's not do that. Uh, anyway, but this piece, I guess I can do this. Uh, Mindless Self Indulgence, just what I called it, which is the name of the band, and I just listened to uh, my favorite songs by them while I was painting it. I just really wanted to play with color, and I wanted to spray paint, and I just wanted to paint something. And I was like, let's go, let's do this. Like, I'm having a really good time, I was in a super good mood, and I was like, yeah, Mindless Self Indulgence, let's do that. The name by itself is kind of loaded, just their band name and what that means, and how they think about art and creating music, living life, etc. And I was in this mood where, you know, the band. They talk about a lot of different stuff, um, but I mean, there's this such sense of fun in a lot of their music, and not taking themselves too seriously, but also they, they you know, bring some concepts up that are maybe filled with, you know, there, there's pain, there's life in their, their songs. Um, there's a lot of sexuality and finding fun in sexuality in their music as well. Um, but yeah, generally it's just like this, this, it's very hyper, for the most part, very hyper spastic, um, high energy music, um, and the vocals are so much fun too. But anyway, mind self indulgence. Like the, again, what was the plan? I just rolled into the studio. And was like, I really want to paint right now. Let's let's get it. And then I uh, decided, okay, uh, what canvases do I have available? I feel like working something. I feel like working on something like this size. That's something we didn't really talk about too. Is picking the size of your canvas, picking the dimensions, what kind of shape you want to work on. If it's a square, if it's masonite board, the materials. That's something obviously in your planning as well. Sometimes it might just be what is available right now and does it work. This is landscape orientation as well. So like those things I should have talked about and I just didn't because I forgot. Um, I didn't do enough planning for the video. But you want to choose something purposeful, right? And I really felt like this would work really well in the landscape orientation, something that lends itself well to that. I could have made it portrait orientation and, and had it like this, but I didn't feel like it. I felt like making these broad gestures like this. I wanted to make something I could really use that high energy to really work on and not have it be very delicate. So I did this all with spray paint, a little bit of acrylic, this purple here, and this little bit here. The rest was all spray paint, and then I guess at the very, towards the end I used some acrylic and then whatever, but we'll, let's just, if we had to give it a percentage, it'd be like 95% spray paint. Um, so it was very quick, I used a palette knife, and I was just going. There wasn't a lot of planning, and I just picked up more colors as I was going, whereas some things, like those other two pieces we talked about, color was very pre-planned, very purposeful. This was just like, man, they're a lot of fun, a lot of high energy. I just want to work with colors that are going to be bold and bright and fun and that go together. I still want to look good. I think this looks amazing, personally. It's one of my favorite pieces that I, that I have. Um, it also helps that I, I, mean, I made this just a couple, maybe not a couple months ago, 
the end of 2018, maybe it was November, December, I want to say December that maybe I made it, but I don't remember. Um, there's a lot of different mark making and stuff, you know, there's a lot of, to me it's very fun, there's a lot of movement happening here, a lot of movement, a lot of uh, different, you know, cuts and directions and, and like, aggressiveness, but also fun, it's, I just, I don't know how to explain it further, but that, that was the planning involved in this piece, was like, yo, I really want to have a lot of fun painting right now, I'm in the mood to, to just do something awesome and high energy, mind of self-indulgence it is, let's go with that, because I was, again, that was just like, the, if we want to call it the philosophy of the band, the, the, the name of the band alone, being their um, manifesto or something, but that's what I really wanted to express, and I, I had a lot of fun with it, so, um, yeah, that's, that's that one by itself, just, you know, very quick. I want to move on to this piece that I just made yesterday, um, which is along the same lines as, as that one, so, if I had, I mean, there's other pieces I've made that we could talk about how they go like, oh, you know, I, I titled this, this, I don't know, I can't even, I, I can see the piece in my mind, but I can't think of, um, I can't think of the name right now, but it's the Smashing Pumpkin song, uh, and I, like, used part of the lyrics in the title, and it was really about mortality, and this, this young person that I was a very far acquaintance from me, I never really spent time alone with them, but, but they, um, they had died in this, this tragic accident and stuff, and I was like, wow, like, I just really wanted to express that. So there's meaning behind it, it was an abstract, I just kind of planned the colors and, and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, you know what, let me put this down for a second. I'll, um, I'll put, I'll put the title of that here, and I'll show you the piece that I'm talking about. Was made some some years ago, but I mean that's an example too. Again, I, I drew from music and this the, the 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 lyrics and the song was really speaking to me in connection with all this event that just happened and it just kind of came together and I was like, yeah, I, I really want to express that. I forgot there's a piece I don't have here. It's for sale at uh, the Great Goat, but an example of, of planning again, really quick. Um, so in the studio, I use, um, I use pieces, or I mean, why well, use pieces? Uh, I, I have like different books that I just keep here that I'm reading through. I've been reading this, through this forever because I don't spend a lot of time reading in the studio like I should. But it's, there's, these are so great. A very short introduction. Uh, this series of books, they have like, you know, very academic stuff like anthropology or sociology or like I had one on postmodernism. Uh, that art movement, um, and some of it's like this, like romanticism, uh, we're just talking about like the the art style of romanticism, not visual art, which it's all really about writing, but they talk a little bit about how that influenced visual art at the time too, but it was like, let's learn about romanticism, what does that mean, let's go through the decades, there's a lot of history here, they're great little books, um, but I was reading this one day in the studio, and I'm going to post the picture here of that, that painting as well, but um, this phrase just came out, it just jumped out at me. I was like, oh, it's beautiful. Um, and it was talking about how to define romanticism. And it was talking about, like, romanticism is, is an abuse of adjectives. Just blew my mind. I love the phrasing, and I love what it meant. And just talking about romanticism is an abuse of adjectives. And you just talk about, like, it's just, again, really charged and really filled with, like, abuse, abuse of adjectives. You were abusing adjectives, and that's what really defines romanticism, and they get into all this stuff. But um, that was just, again, like the planning involved was, okay, I want to make a piece about this, like, right now. It's just an amazing line. I wrote the line down. I don't remember if I did it right away or if I um, did it the, the next day or something, but I remember I made it pretty quick after I found that. I was so inspired by that, the use of those, of that, that, those words together in that sentence, an abusive adjective, so that's the title of that piece, and I was like, romanticism, so I picked my colors, these were, this light color palette, very pastel, um, there's like some, some peaches and, and some reds, and there's this light blue, and it, it, to me it is a very soft piece, um, the gold in there, like I, I feel like it, it, it's just, it's very soft is how I feel, and I, I mean, music was a huge thing, I put on him, the, the band him is a feral majesty and it's it's all very romantic they 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 their own genre they would call love metal this finnish band i, I really love them a lot but it's it's very romantic music and um 
for me anyway, it depends on, on your tastes and how you define romantic. But anyway, uh, it's, it's really corny as well, but that's that's what I love about it sometimes. That's kind of what they were talking about. Like, romanticism is abuse of adjectives. It's like, anyway, so I just, you know, the planning process, I I had, had this line and it was like, wow, inspired and what do I do with this piece? And it was kind of, it was the same, I think, size as the one I showed you last time, Mind with Self-Indulgence. And, and I was like, yeah, I want to do this this thing and just make it soft and beautiful and like, romanticism I mean, there's, with romantic stuff and love and whatever like there's also pain there's push and pull there's all these things i wanted to express this this abuse of adjectives somehow so that was that one anyway okay now this one i made this yesterday and uh, it was one of those days where i was like yo i just really want to paint i want to paint what do i do i haven't painted anything for two weeks um let me just go get some canvas. This had a little bit of physical texture on it uh, already. Oh, I got it upside down. What an idiot. Um, okay, so this this had some physical texture on it already, which is kind of down here, which maybe you can kind of see this, these spots. Um, there's some more down there as well. But anyway, so I was just like, hey, I just really want to paint. Let's do it. I kind of felt like doing something that was kind of a landscape, but I really wanted to work abstractly, and I was like, maybe I can make like an abstract landscape. This is very abstract. Landscape was in my mind because I put this texture down originally to do a landscape, because I was going to have like, like this was going to be like the, the horizon line, and the rest was going to be sky, and I think there's still some of that maybe in here, but this kind of looks like a body of water. Um, so it's still very, you know, there's elements to it that are landscape-y, but it's still very much an abstract. And I was like, hey, I, I started to see colors in my mind. So again, the planning portion, there wasn't really much. It was like, I want to paint. Let's paint. Let's do some kind of landscaping in my mind, but abstract, we'll see where it goes. I just left, I trusted in the process. I didn't really have a vision. I just was like, man, I really want to paint. Let's do it. Found this canvas. I was like, yeah, I like the texture that I put on there already because I put it on a long time ago and I didn't use it. Um, and then I was thinking of colors, like I really want to fill a lot of the space with this green that I don't use very often. And it's a viridian green, I think is what it was. And so I put that in a lot of places. Again, with an abstract, everything you do informs the next thing that you do. So every mark I make, every color I use, that influences what's going to happen next. So I put this green down and I was like, well, you know, I, I really want some highlights. What's going to be my light color? What's going to be my dark color? I have this dark turquoise that was going to be one of the darkest things in here. I want to play with purple. I really wanted just some bold red. Like, I just started putting these colors on. There's also a blue, this manganese blue that I rarely ever use. And I was just like, okay, hey, let's, let's just start adding colors. I went live for it. I did record a video for this, which will come out maybe a day or two after this video. So you can see the art process of this piece, because I was recording it. I did it from the chess cam, so we'll see how that works out. But um, I should say that, I, again, music is very important for me. So I didn't have a strong direction for this piece. And I was like, well, what do I feel like right now? Um, you know what? I haven't listened to Nirvana in such a long time. And it's so good. Like, so good. And there's a range of things that go on with Nirvana emotionally and mentally, conceptually. And I was like, let's do it. Let's just put on the discography. And then soon I switched it. So it was just in utero, never mind. But I listened to a little bit of Bleach and it sets aside as well. Anyway, so I was like, let's just put on Nirvana. And I just went to town, started painting. And then, you know, there's some songs that get sad, and there's, there's a lot of heaviness and rawness and stuff in, in, in their music. So, eventually, while I was painting, I came upon this phrase. Um, and it wasn't a phrase that they said, but it was just a feeling I got, I guess, of the phrase I came upon. I wrote a phrase in my mind, a sentence, that was just, I don't remember what song it was that triggered it. I wish I, wish I could. I mean, it's a general feeling from all the music, but there was a song when I, that, was, I was, that was on when I had this phrase. And uh, I wrote it down um, while I was making it, and it is, uh, there are spaces of me still untouched. I don't remember what I was listening to, but I was just looking at what I had here, and I, I had that, so somehow that phrase came to my mind, because I was listening and I was painting, but also sometimes you just start thinking automatically. Sometimes painting can be very meditative, even though there's a lot, you're doing stuff, and you've got music playing, especially like Nirvana sometimes, like it's pretty heavy and just like, like a lot of distortion and stuff going on there. But I just have that, like your mind, it's just, it's again, it's a very mindful, mindfulness activity kind of where, where uh, sometimes, especially with abstracts, you're just free flowing and just grabbing paint and just doing this and just going. 
and it gives my mind time to wander sometimes. And that's how I was interacting with the music. I was interacting with my own painting where I was at emotionally uh, in that moment. And there are spaces of me still, un or yeah, there's spaces of me still untouched is this sentence that I thought of in my mental meanderings. And um, that's, yeah, I, I feel like this accurately represents that. Um, you know, I, I don't get an opportunity when I have to just deconstruct paintings and I really obviously like talking about myself and my work, so take that for what you will. But uh, this it's not 100% finished because I need to paint the edges. But yeah, so the planning portion of this was just, again, grabbing the canvas that I felt would work for I don't know what, um, landscape slash abstract, and I just started grabbing colors and adding more colors because they worked with the other colors I was using you know, using some aggressive strokes, using some soft ones in there, and then responding to those, responding to the music, responding to my own gestures that I was making, and that's what I came up with. So, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of, it's kind of where we're at right now. Um, there's a, there's a piece, I mean, if you've stuck with it this long, kudos to you. I think I'm going to wrap it up here pretty quick because um, the next installment is going to be about texture because I want to go through the process. This was all just like, hey, like let's talk about how you, I've planned my pieces in the past. What does planning mean? Getting concepts, whatever else. Thinking about color, texture, and composition in the plan a little bit. Um, but I want to take you through creating an abstract piece moment by moment by moment. And so um, what I'd like to do, I guess, is is, is talk about this next piece that I'm going to make, that I haven't made yet, that I'm going to start right now. Okay, so pretty quickly I want to run through this piece I'm going to make so that we can continue talking about the process of making an abstract piece. Um, sometimes I'm in a place where I'm like every piece I make is different, different process, different themes, different materials. And I'm not really 100% like everything's different right now, but I feel like 50-50, like the thing I'm going to do this time is pretty different. But experimenting and doing different stuff all the time is obviously how I grow and learn and just like, I just, I'm just, it's in a mood too. Because sometimes I'll use like, hey, I'm using inch and a half thick profile canvas, bunch of squares, maybe even the same size for like three or four pieces in a row. Sometimes that's just what happens. This is how it works. Um, but again, my whiteboard over there a while ago, I was here with Laura Lee and I was painting this months ago. And I don't remember if it was something she said or just we were having a conversation or just thought of the word dumb hope. You know, one word, dumb hope. And I really liked that sentiment. It just the way that it made me feel has like an innocence to it and positivity and just a beautifulness to it. And it's just sitting there on the whiteboard for a couple months. And um, after I was listening to Nirvana that day, creating the other piece we already talked about, I mean, there's a song called Dumb and, and I, I really like it. And there's this phrase in there too that's very reflective of, of, of this dumb hope. Uh, the way that I'm interpreting that phrase, and it's, um, uh, you know, like maybe I'm dumb, maybe I'm happy, basically, is what it is. Um, maybe I'm just happy. So, uh, there's a lot of going, other stuff in that song, but I was just thinking, like, oh, dumb hope, and, and, and listening to the song Dumb the other day, and now they're kind of aligning, they're, it's the right time. Like, when I see stuff on the whiteboard, I'm very aware that it's there. But sometimes it'll sit there for months and months and months, because I'm just not ready for it. Um, I, I should go through my other lists of things more often so I'm more aware of these ideas I have floating around. And then when it's the right time and it connects, it connects. So the planning part of this thing I'm going to do is really, again, I had this inspiration a long time ago, and now it's just like the music I was listening to the other day, I'm still kind of in, I want to be in this more positive space right now, explore this kind of like innocent, positive vibe, and uh, express that visually somehow. So... This is already been painted on. Um, I don't really know what orientation I'm going to use for this piece yet. Um, but I actually, yes I do. I th I, well, I, I think it's going to be portrait. And um, this is already painted on. I'm going to I'm gonna go over this um, just, I guess, for the sake of, of, the, of the video. Normally I would just paint over it while I'm whatever. Anyway, I painted this a while ago. I don't remember what I was going to do with it. Um, I have a feeling I was going to paint a picture of a pink guy on this um, because of the hot pink that I have there, but that idea has come and gone, and I'm not going to do that on this thing anymore. 
Um, as you'll notice, it's like a 16 by 20 thin profile, which is like half an inch thick. You get these from Michaels, like I think now it's like five in a pack for like seven dollars or something ridiculous. They've always been cheap. They're decent canvas. When you're starting out, uh, those are like the best quality bang for your buck canvases you get if you're financially conscious or fiscally responsible, whatever you want to call it. If you don't have a lot of money, but you've got money to buy some canvas, that's not from the dollar store. These 16 by 20s, so many pieces I made in the beginning were made on these because of that. Um, I decided I want to use this for, for one thing. We're going to go over the texture thing next video. There's a little bit of physical texture on here already, but uh, I'm going to put some more on. I'm going to gesso it and, and go over it um, and then add some more physical texture on before we start making it. But this is part of the planning too, is like what are my materials that I'm going to use? I'm probably going to use just acrylic. I might use a little bit of spray paint in there. Um, but my idea right now, I could obviously change it at any moment while I'm creating, right? Just go with the process and trust the process. But um, So this isn't really giving me much direction for where I'm going to go because I'm going to gesso over this. It's going to be white. and uh, But I kind of wanted to use a 16 by 20 thin profile, just kind of something more basic. Um, one, I have it in the other studio. It's available to me. Um, I don't have to go and buy something new. But also I'm just like the size is kind of right for what I want to express. And again, I want to express something more light, positive, and innocent, and like dumb hope. And this is kind of like, it's not like the super professional, thick profile, very formal, like this is fine art, capital, fine art, canvas. Um, <coughs> um, there's something innocent just about the materials I'm using in a way. So that's what I'm going to work on next. Then the, again, the, I don't have... Um, a lot in my mind right now, so I guess I can share what I have in my mind right now and see if it ends up panning out. I have like a very pale yellow in my mind, pale yellow and white, um, and I kind of see like a more circular thing um, happening in the center. I don't know if that's what's going to stay or not, but that's kind of what I have in my mind, this, this dumb hope thing. So um, yeah, I, I think this kind of ends the, the planning. Um, portion that I want to talk about when how do you create an abstract piece went through a bunch of different examples I have way more examples that we could go through but I, I have tons of abstracts that I've done if you want to see them uh, you can check my Instagram my FK Arts Instagram but that's very linear with like obviously when I post it's dated um, and you'll see just whatever only the stuff from the last couple of years because I haven't been using Instagram for that long in comparison to Facebook um, if you want to see any of my art, uh, I, I, you know, Instagram is like more my day to day and like my thoughts, my research, my some photos on there, whatever, and some finished pieces on there as well. I started out just with finished pieces, but anyway, on Facebook I have things. In, the albums are by category. You want to see all the abstracts I've ever done and see the evolution of them? You can go to Facebook and check that out because you just click on albums and you go down and it's like abstracts 2008 to 2010 or like abstracts 2018, abstracts 2019. Like they're all there by category and by year. So you can look through all these abstracts I've done. Um, yeah, so FK Arts, Facebook. Uh, there's always, um, you know, links in the description to, to that as well if you can't find it for some reason. But uh, you should be able to. And if you ever have questions about specific pieces, whether there's meaning, what was the process like, you, or you just want to comment on stuff, then for sure. And there you can find the titles, the dimensions, the medium, and the date. Uh, it, it does not go through the, the concept or the meaning when I have them on Facebook at all. It just like, it's titled, you know, it, it's got the title there, it's got the mediums I used, um, and the year. It, like that's basically what it's got going on there. Sometimes I might link a song. There's very few times when I'm like, oh, this is inspired by this band, and and uh, yeah, it's not on there a lot. But sometimes it is. If you, but yeah, if you've got any questions or comments about specific pieces, if you go looking for stuff, then I would be so happy to answer those. Like I said, uh, maybe I'm just really vain or whatever, but I really like talking about art. Period, and especially my art because I can talk about my art because I did it. I have all the knowledge. I know what I was going through. I know how it was made. I know the struggles I went, whatever, the learning that happened. Uh, I love talking about art. I hope that somebody got something out of this. Uh, it's, it's a long video, but I wanted to go through some different examples with you. Um, the next one will be very short because we're gonna talk about texture in an abstract piece and how I, I apply that. You'll see me kind of take that canvas that I showed you for this dumb hope piece. I'm gonna apply some texture, quickly talk about it a little bit. 
Um, and then the next one after that will be the painting. And so that'll be in the art process and in the instructional playlist. Um, but like, I, I also remind you that this, this piece here that I talked about, um, it, it is an art process video that will be up about a day or two after this one goes up um, because I, I was wearing the, uh, the cam, I was wearing the GoPro, so you'll be able to check that out if you want. Again, you got questions or comments, please, 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 please leave me questions or comments. Um, I'm really happy when someone engages with the stuff. Uh, I'm sure some people get something out of it and then they don't say anything. If you've even got criticism, please give me that then. Um, it's, it's good. Okay, so with that, again, comment, you know, like, subscribe, check more videos out. Um...